All right, uh, let's open our Bibles as we begin our preaching time. I'm going to ask you to turn in the New Testament to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. Luke 12, and I'll call your attention to two verses there, verses 47 and 48, as we get underway. Luke 12, verses 47 and 48. Here the Lord Jesus is speaking. And he says, And that servant, which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not, and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more." Last week, I brought a sermon I called The Paradox of Christ. A paradox is a statement that seems to convey or contain two seemingly contrary ideas, and yet both ideas are true at the same time. And I listed several examples last week, I think about nine examples, and they were such as these, the Lord Jesus hungered in the wilderness, Matthew 4. And yet he was able to feed multitudes. He thirsted from the cross of Calvary, and yet he told the woman at the well that he offered the water of life. The Lord Jesus uh, prayed to the Heavenly Father, and yet he's said to hear our prayers and answer our prayers. And several other examples along those same lines. Today I want to bring the sequel to that sermon, and I call this the paradox of the Christian. The paradox of the Christian. This text says, Unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. As a Christian, a child of God, you have many privileges. But along with those privileges come certain responsibilities. Your boss has privileges that you don't have as an employee. He gets to set the company policies and make up the rules for everyone to abide by, and only he or she, whichever the case may be these days, is free to break those if they think it's necessary. But you better not. The boss can take an extra long lunch hour or go home and not come back at all for the rest of the day but you better not try it. <laughs> so he has certain uh, resp uh, uh, privileges that you don't have, but he also has responsibilities that you don't have. The company is only your concern while you're on the clock, while you're there. It's his concern and his worry 24 hours a day. Um, even more so if his family name might be out, out front on the sign, his reputation in the community is on the line all the time. He has to meet payroll, he has to meet the, the budget and the expenses, the cost of doing business. He has to uh, succeed in a number of ways uh, so that his reputation uh, stays intact in the community. <clears throat> so he has uh, privileges, but he also has responsibilities that you don't have. If your father was the mayor of your town, your city, or even the chief of police, it might bring with it certain privileges. You might meet other dignitaries, uh, important people in the community or the county. You might get to meet the governor of your state. You might on occasion meet a celebrity, depending on the event. That's a privilege that comes with it. But you also have the responsibility not to get in trouble with the law yourself, and then damage his image in the public eye by association. So that's privilege and responsibility. And it's with those ideas or that dichotomy in mind, I want to bring this sermon I call The Paradox of the Christian. Now, this is actually going to be part one. Um, I have two parts to the sequel. And so God willing, we'll bring the second part of the sequel next week. But let's jump right into it. And point number one, let me say this. We are made nigh or close to God, and yet we're told to draw nigh to God. 
Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. The shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ had the miraculous power to break down the wall uh, that separated you and God by your own sins. God. Thank the Lord for that. Um, and yet we read in Hebrews 10, verse 22, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And also we read in the book of James, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. James 4, verse 8. So while the blood of Christ was sufficient to reconcile you uh, with the Heavenly Father once again, you have a responsibility to stay as close to God uh, from day to day as you possibly can. Why wouldn't you want to do that? This is often... <clears throat> Distinguished, or this is rather, this is defined as the difference between a Christian's standing and his state. Your standing is one who is saved, but your state might fluctuate. Are you living like a saved person ought to live? Are you doing those things that a saved person ought to do? You might live in a beautiful mansion in Beverly Hills. That's your standing. You're someone who's wealthy enough to live in the best, one of the best neighborhoods uh, in this part of the world. That's your standing. But does that mansion need a paint job? Does the grass need to be cut? Is there algae in the swimming pool? Did you forget to drop, uh, push your trash barrels out to the curb on trash day, so now they're overflowing? That's the state. That's not the state you wanted to be in. Nor is that the state your neighbors wanted to be in. So we're made nigh by the saving power of Jesus Christ, yet we're told to draw nigh. That's a paradox. Secondly, let me say this. We've been forgiven, and yet we're to seek forgiveness as Christians. Colossians 2, verses 13 and 14 say, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncleanness, rather, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Well, that sounds pretty thorough. That sounds pretty complete. That sounds like it's all been done. Nothing more to do. And yet the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. You've been forgiven by God, but you're to seek continual forgiveness by God. Say, well, why do I have to keep seeking for continual forgiveness? Because you keep sinning. That's why. It's as simple as that. You know, the, the last nine books in the New Testament, Hebrews through Revelation, are what we call the general epistles. They weren't written by the Apostle Paul. They were written by other apostles for their purposes. And those books, doctrinally and technically, are intended for someone to obey and follow literally in the tribulation after the rapture takes place under, the, under a reign of an antichrist in a one-world government and the worst time of persecution the Jew will ever face. And there are some, people, some Christians, believe it or not, since 1 John 1, 9 is contained within that section of books, they say that doesn't apply to the Christian today. A Christian doesn't have to keep apologizing for his sins. He doesn't have to keep seeking forgiveness from God. Just in, trust the forgiveness that you received once upon a time when you were born again and move on from there. And there may be some small kernel of truth in what they're saying, only in that you can't lose your salvation no matter what you do. It's saved. You're, you're saved and it's secure. So it doesn't matter if you confess your sin, don't confess it, ask forgiveness, don't get forgiveness. 
if you're saved, you're saved. You didn't, listen, but it's always seemed rather arrogant, presumptuous to me for someone to say, I don't have to keep going back to God and asking him to forgive me and seeking forgiveness and apologize. If you're not going to ask for forgiveness, then you might as well not apologize either, right? Who wants to be your friend if you never say, I'm sorry for the thing I did? Listen, do you know, let's say you're a saved man. Do you know that, does your wife rather know that you love her? Did you make that clear, abundantly clear, the day you got married and exchanged vows? Sure. But isn't it smart to remind her from time to time? <laughs> to tell her that you still love her? Or wife, tell your husband you still love him? Isn't it a good idea to do that? You better believe it. And uh, John also says, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. And do not the truth. 1 John 1 verse 6. Isn't fellowship something every Christian should desire? No matter what age, tribulation, church age, any time. Isn't fellowship, close fellowship with God something every believer should want? It certainly should be. Then you have to humble yourself, confess your sins, admit when you've sinned, and ask God to forgive you once again. Maintain that fellowship. Keep it fresh and alive between you and God at all times. So you've been forgiven, but you're to seek continual forgiveness. Point number three, let me say this. We're clean, and yet we are to cleanse ourselves along the way. Christ told his disciples, Now you're clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. John 15, verse 3. And Paul writes, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Ephesians 5, verses 25 and 26. If you believe, that the, if you believe the word of God, you've trusted in what the Bible says for the cleansing of your soul, the salvation of your soul, and the washing away of your sins, your, your destination is, is an eternal, sinless, a pure city, not made by human hands, made by God. That's where you're going. And your, your future one day is to be changed and transformed like the resurrected Jesus Christ one day. And, and the creation God intends for every believer will be made complete when that time comes. That's part of your privilege. But Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved... Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. That's your responsibility. That's certainly not limited to somebody only in the tribulation. That's something, every, that's an admonition every saint of God ought to take to heart. Uh, not only have you been cleansed by the work of God and the work of the Holy Spirit, but you're to cleanse yourself and keep yourself unspotted from the world and untainted, uncorrupted, and unpolluted from anything that would contaminate and, and ruin and hurt your reputation and your daily state as a believer. Your standing is someone saved, but you want to live like someone who's saved. You might be a saint, but are you living saintly? There's a great distinction to be made there. John also said, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John 1 verse 7. And so confession and separation and daily repentance are something every believer ought to engage in and practice every day. Um, you might, listen, you might drive a brand new car off the dealer's lot. It's shiny, it looks nice, now it's yours. But it's going to need to be washed from time to time, right? Well, there's a great, I suppose you could take, a, take that and make a spiritual application. Uh, that comes through the Word of God and those things which I just mentioned to keep you uh, as you ought to be before the Lord Jesus Christ from day to day. So we're clean, and yet we're to keep ourselves clean. We're to cleanse ourselves as we go. Point number four, 
We're seated in heavenly places, yet we run a race here on the earth. We're seated in heaven, yet we run a race here on the earth. Ephesians 2, verses 5 and 6 tell us, Even when we were dead in sins, God hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's right now. If you've been born again by the saving power of God, there's a part of you, don't ask me to fully explain it because I can't, but there's a part of you, because the word of God says so, that's already in heaven with Jesus Christ. Because you're joined to him. You're joined to him. You're part of his body. How do I get into Jesus Christ? Well, you ask Christ to come into you. It's as simple as that. John 14, verse 20, the Lord Jesus said, At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. You want to get into Jesus Christ? Ask Jesus Christ to come live in you. It'll be done. And Dr. Ruckman used to say, If you want to go to heaven, trust Jesus Christ. If you want to go to hell, trust something else. Say what? Anything. Trust anything else and you'll go to hell. You know, the case for your eternal security is so strong there in 1 John that um, the only way God could strip you of your salvation would be to kick his own son out of heaven. That's because you and he are that closely associated with one another. That's why collectively all Christians are referred to as the body of Jesus Christ. You're united with him by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit. You and I are in the third heaven. Truly, we're, we're waiting for these bodies of flesh to be changed and transformed uh, and be made like the resurrected Son of God. I can't wait for that to happen. That'll be a great day when it happens, right? But, um, and by the way, this is how I know that the Christians, the church, will, will not have to face the Antichrist and go through a tribulation. <clears throat> if... If uh, I'm not waiting, I'm not waiting to pass a future test to make sure I don't take the mark of the beast, to make sure I don't worship the Antichrist, to make sure I help the Jew in his great time of persecution. I'm saved now. I'm not waiting to endure to the end of the tribulation. Listen, if the church goes through the tribulation, then there is no tribulation. It's effectively still the church age, right? The church is still here. So there really is no tribulation, if that's the case. Are you trying to tell me that right now I'm confident of my salvation? It can't be taken away. It's, I'm saved for sure. I'm secure in Jesus Christ. But I'm waiting to face a time when I might lose it if I'm not careful? Baloney! Right. Or stronger words to that effect. Yeah. <laughs> if the church has to go through the tribulation, then it's not the tribulation. It's, it's still the church age. And yet, Hebrews 12, 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. That race is here on the earth. Sometimes it's called the rat race, and nobody likes that, right? But there's still much that needs to be done for the sake of Jesus Christ, Figure out what you're good at. Figure out what your talents are. Figure out where your interests lie and how they can best be uh, steered for the purpose and the serving of Jesus Christ, to steer other people to Jesus Christ. You want, listen, you don't want to be someone who's putting roadblocks in the way for someone to get saved. You want to smooth out that path and make it as easy for your friends, for your loved ones, for somebody else to be born again as possible. Yeah. But we're seated in heaven, but we run a race here on the earth. Point number five. We follow after peace. Yet we fight the good fight of faith. Yes. We follow after peace. Yet we fight the good fight of faith. Hebrews 12 verse 14 tells us. Follow peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Paul also tells believers. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Romans 14, verse 19. 
But the same apostle who wrote those words likewise, uh, likens the Christian to a fighter. He likens the Christian to a soldier doing battle. He says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, wherewith thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. You have made a great profession in front of other people. You said you were a Christian, now start acting like one. You said you were saved, live like you're saved. You said you were born again, then all, certain things ought to change. Your speech ought to change. Your habits ought to change. Your conduct ought to change. Your appearance ought to change. Your desires ought to change. Your interest in the, the, the souls and the, the needs of other people ought to change. The desire to win souls and try to be a testimony along the way from day to day at work, at school, wherever you go, those things ought to change. You know, it was interesting. Before you got saved, you could have cared less about the Bible. It wasn't interesting to you at all. But once you're saved, you realize salvation came to you. It didn't require a special costume. It didn't require a special string of beads or a candle. It didn't require a special priest. It didn't require a special minister. It didn't require you to memorize some pre-written text. It didn't require any of those things that, except to admit you were a sinner and you needed God to forgive you. As a matter of fact, and I've said this before, I'll say it again. God gave us only one physical, tangible object to put in our hands and have physical contact with. It's not a special robe. It's not a special haircut. It's not a special set of underwear like the Mormons believe in. It's nothing, none of those things. Beyond that, we walk by faith, not by sight. And if salvation can come to you that freely and that effortlessly by admitting you're a sinner in need of forgiveness, then you ought to be thankful for it and you, you profess it, then certain things ought to, ought to change in you. But um, we're seated in heavenly places. We run a, we run a race down here. We follow, we, we follow after peace, yet we fight the good fight of faith. Um, a Christian, you know, a Christian doesn't go out of his way trying to be obnoxious and offensive and saying the wrong things and hurting people's feelings. People are so sensitive, their feelings get hurt at the drop of a hat anyway. But you don't go out of your way to do that. It sort of happens naturally. <laughs> Without trying, you say the wrong thing and somebody else says, well, that's not what we believe at our church. Well, your church is wrong. Those things seem to happen without much effort on your part. And the um, Bible makes it clear that our fight isn't a physical fight, it's a spiritual fight. And against the forces of sin and Satan. For though we walk in the, in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10. Verses 3 and 4. We follow after peace, yet we fight the good fight of faith. I remember when I was a boy, I was, I guess, I don't know, 7th, 8th grade, ninth grade, my dad and mom allowed me to take uh, Taekwondo lessons. I wasn't real good at it. I mean, I was good enough to beat up my brother. But he was probably, most of the time, he was good enough to beat me up, too, without even taking the lessons. So we're sort of like a standoff. We had one good one that went all over the backyard one time. I mean, it took us about 20 minutes to, to fight that whole thing out. <laughs> Surprised that either one of us still have teeth. But, you know, my dad didn't want me to go out starting a fight, but if one came to me, I should be at least prepared to defend myself. And you can make a spiritual application there as well. You don't try to start fights with somebody. You don't try to pick on someone else's false doctrine. But if you're reading the Bible, if you're memorizing Scripture, if you're asking the Holy Spirit to be your ultimate teacher, then when someone wants to mock the Word of God, they want to make fun of you as a Christian, they want to make fun of the whole uh, life of a believer, then you're ready to take them on. You're ready to defend the honor of Jesus Christ. I remember a guy years ago, a place that I worked at, he was always making cracks about Christians. Yeah, Bible thumpers, Bible thumpers, and these churchgoers and so forth. And uh, his name was uh, Chico. And I said, uh, you know, Chico, you're an interesting guy. 
I said, uh, there seems to me there's two people in the world. There's people like you who seem to know everything about the Bible. And then there's people like me who actually read it. He didn't say anything else after that day. I mean, he was quiet from that point on. You answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceits, the Bible tells us. The Bible says, For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. 2 Timothy 1 verse 12, which leads me to point number 6, my last point. We're kept by the power of God, and yet we're to keep ourselves. We're kept by the power of God, yet we are told to keep ourselves. This goes back to my first point, uh, the, distinct, the, the distinction between a Christian standing, he's saved, and his state, his daily state of affairs. You don't keep yourself saved. God does that. You didn't save yourself. Only God could do that. You are to keep yourself unpolluted from the world. Everything that contaminates, everything that pollutes, everything that can corrupt you and can ruin your testimony, can ruin your reputation, can burn down bridges that you're trying to build, all of those things, you're to keep yourselves from anything that has that destructive influence. The Bible says, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God unto salvation through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 1 Peter 1, verses 5 and 6. God the Father does the saving, and God the Father has to do the keeping. And yet at the same time, God says, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so-called. He gives an example there. 1 Timothy 6, verse 20. So-called science might not be scientific. And uh, you're on the internet sometime, if you're so inclined, just type in, you know, scientific blunders, scientific mistakes, and read how often science was wrong about one theory or another. The idea that they're absolute and everything is, is false. I have an old... Um, World Almanac, it was published in the early 30s. Old black and white pictures, but there was a picture of the moon, some astronomer's conception of the moon, and uh, the dark side of the moon, which they say the moon doesn't rotate, so we see the same side of the moon all the time, facing the Earth. But the artist's conception was that the moon was actually uh, oblong, almost like an egg, and we're only seeing one end of it, so it looks round from our perspective. But the true shape of the moon is shaped more like an oblong, like an egg. That was the dark part of the moon that we don't see. That was the, the theory of the science. Well, that was, that's wrong. That's false. So right now, their big thing is man's causing global warming. You mean the sun doesn't have anything to do with it? How do we, how do we make the sun do what it does? How do we cause, force the sun to warm up the earth the way it does? It's very arrogant on the part of man to think he's responsible. Listen, I got uh, articles in my office that go back only 30 years saying that we are on the brink of a worldwide freezing epidemic. There's going to be a new ice age taking over the earth. 30 years ago, Time magazine, science journals said there was a new ice age. And they're blaming it, uh, climate change, climate science was blaming uh, men for causing the, just about a new um, freezing over the, earth, over the earth. Funny how quickly they changed from, we're just about to freeze to death, and now we're going to burn up to death. And now they say, they, they call it climate change. They can't make up their mind what they believe. They don't know what to believe. That's just one example the, the Apostle Paul cites. You be careful what goes into your mind. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful what you believe in. Be careful what you subscribe to and start to re repeat. It might not be true. But you're to keep yourself clean before the eyes of God in this life. Watch those things that come into your mind. Watch those things that come into your ears. Watch the influences, the things that uh, creep into your thought life. 
watch the people you're with. You're to keep yourself from the wrong um, friends, if that's the case. Wrong, t they might tempt you to do the wrong things. You know, realize, you know the, the um, I'm just about to bring this to a close, but the idea of glorifying God simply means to honor God. You want to glorify Jesus Christ? Honor Jesus Christ. If there's a place that doesn't honor Jesus Christ, you shouldn't go there. Stop hanging around that place. Stop going there, if at all possible. If there are certain people that don't honor Jesus Christ, stop hanging around with them. Don't make them your best friends. If there are certain events, certain activities that are not honoring to the purity of Jesus Christ, maybe you shouldn't participate in them. Maybe you shouldn't get involved in them. That's all it means. You can understand that, then you can understand how to glorify God with your life. And those things that you possess and should be surrendered to his use as he sees fit. But as a Christian, you have unspeakable privileges, but they also bring with it uh, great responsibilities. It's your standing, that is, you're a saved child of, of God, uh, versus your state. What state of affairs is it in at the moment? I've only given you a few examples. And like I say, this will be part one. God willing, we'll take up part two next time. To whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. This is what I call the paradox of the Christian. 